Like all Steger expeditions, this one involves a little dreaming, a lot of planning, and plenty of building. But the trip from Yellowknife to Copper Mine starts with the dogs as usual. What isn't usual is the addition of two women to the international team of six to demonstrate to the kids of the World School following the expedition that Arctic adventures aren't for men only. I think it's a, a rare opportunity that Takako and I have to be role models. And um, in terms of the education that we can that we can actually offer, I think that's our strongest place. When the team pulls into Copper Mine, the members share their perspectives of the expedition, and in return, the natives share a bit of their culture. Soon enough, it's back on the ice pack of the Amundsen Gulf, and the team settles into the familiar routine of pulling, hauling, slogging, and coaxing tired dogs and bodies across the snow and ice. Lunch becomes a welcome break. These are frozen cashews. And I put these in hot water because the cashew, if it's frozen, can break your teeth. So I put it in hot water to thaw it out. And since it's cold here, I eat with a spoon. That way I can use my gloves. Uh -huh. And also when the, when the cashew is warm, it has a flavor to it. When you eat it cold, it tastes almost like a powder. At night, when the camp is struck, tents pitched, stoves fired up, and dogs tied down, it's time to check in with the World School, waiting for a message on Earth Day. Okay, I'll have, uh, I'll write a report for Earth Day. I'll write a report for Earth Day, over. By now, it's coming on springtime in the Arctic, when ice turns to slush and slush to water. The team even takes to traveling at night, when temperatures fall and water freezes. Every once in a while, the monotony of white is broken. Natives call these the smoking mountains, open wounds in the earth's crust that bubble and belch. Sulfur. By the time the resupply plane arrives, the team is ready. The dogs go out, the canoe sleds come off, and there's fresh fish for dinner and a real celebration in honor of Ulrich's birthday. Um. I am from Russia, the youngest on the Urikasha. He is presenting Danish key. He is a present too. Forgot. God, that was just what I wanted. That's a good one for you. Back on the trail, headed for Tuk to Yuk Tuk. The sledding is anything but easy. Each of the canoe sleds is loaded with 500 pounds of gear. And the ice is still unpredictable, as the team discovers one morning after they crawl out of the tents for a look around. When we're camping on the Arctic Ocean now, the Arctic Ocean is a, is a moving, shifting mass of ice. So, and uh, things don't always end up where you want it, want it to be. In this case here, the ice just simply broke by our tent at night and kind of split between the tents. And uh, we have precautions if, we, if it does split by the tent, we are able to get out real quickly, but these are just part of, the, part of the unknowns. When the ice doesn't crack, it melts, making the tents look a little like muskrat houses in a spring marsh. Well, the high water is flooding us. It's, it's 6.15, so we figure the, the thaw will stop in about three hours, but uh, we don't know if next three hours if we're going to be flooded out. But if we make it three hours, then the water will start going down again, so. But Will Steger and friends have seen these conditions before. And on May 25th, they pull into Tuk to Yuk Tuk, three months and 1,200 miles from Yellowknife. It is another successful training run, the last before the 1995 International Arctic Expedition, from Russia across the North Pole to Prince Patrick Island. Number five. Number five, yeah. It's 3.30 uh, Minneapolis time. No, 2.30 Minneapolis time. May 25th. On 90, schedule. 90. Oh. Now we go home. <laughs>